Hey, Brian Young here. Today's video is hiring book sourcers. So a very exciting portion of the book flipping course is taking that, those first few steps to get people to start working for you. Get, so get, to get people to start working in your business so you can spend more time working on your business. And one of those first decisive steps for most people is hiring somebody to do the book sourcing for you or at least partner with you while you source books. And so I'm going to explain to you um, all the steps that I would take to, to, to set up your first book sourcer. I'm going to walk you through that in an organized fashion. But it is really exciting. This is, a, this is a really exciting part of the business because I know some of you out there may be a little apprehensive about this because you are forfeiting a lot of control of your business, whether it's just, just control over the day-to-day -day operation of things or even control of the finances. So you're partitioning part of your buying budget out to somebody to source books for you. And that can be extremely nerve-wracking, I know. But I also know that once you get through those fears, you overcome those fears with courage, you're going to see on the other end that it's a wonderful thing. Like I know that if you hire somebody properly, like if you do your due diligence and you interview people and you pick the right candidate and you put them in a position to succeed, you are going to be thrilled to have somebody sourcing these books for you and you're not going to look back. In fact, you're going to wonder why you didn't do this sooner. So that's why I'm really excited about this. This could have a major impact on your life and on your business. I know a lot of people that were very hesitant to outsource any of their business you know, outside of their family, outside of their maybe their spouse and them. But once they did, if they hired the, the good people, they were very pleased they did. And um, really, it just showed them that the sky's the limit as far as their business is concerned. So before we get in, I'm just going to give you an overview of all the things we're going to discuss in this video series. There's a lot to go over, so I'm going to try to go, th go through it as fast as possible. Um, I, don't, I, do, I want to value your time. I don't want to spend too much time on, on fluff. I just want to get right to the point. Um, we're going to give you a quick overview of what a book sourcer is and does. We're going to talk about buying criteria. I'm going to share with you again my buying criteria and encourage you to come up with your own. We're going to discuss the importance of a good compensation plan. Next, we're going to look at equipment that your book sourcing people will need, where they should get it, what they should get, how they should pay for it, that sort of thing. We're going to talk about training, how you're going to train your book sourcers in. We're going to discuss the job description. So I put together a job description for our book sourcers that work for our company, our book sourcing specialists, as I like to call them. And then I share this job description on, on websites that I advertise for open positions. And I'll share, I'll share mine with you so you can kind of come up with your own. And finally, we'll look at, we'll discuss places where you can potentially find people to source books for you, whether it's family, friends, or complete strangers. And we'll discuss the pros and cons to all those. So let's jump right in. What is a book sourcer? To source means to obtain items from a particular location or a particular source. So I know that word gets thrown around a lot. But when you're out sourcing, it's a verb, when you're out sourcing product, it means you're out evaluating and purchasing product at particular locations with the intent to resell online for a profit. So if anybody says to you, yeah, I'd like to work for your company, what in the world is a book sourcer or book sourcing specialist? You can say, well, book sourcing specialist is somebody who goes to thrift stores or book sales or, or wherever, evaluates books, purchasing books specifically that meet our criteria, and then we will resell those online for a profit. So that's what a book sourcer does in a nutshell. It's really important for you to determine your buy criteria. Before you can even ask anybody to come on board and start working for you, you need to have this down. It's really important because it's really the keys. It's really the, the criteria that's necessary for them to succeed. And so here's our book buying criteria. I know I've, I've shared it in a variety of other places, so you may have heard it before. But our buy cost, so the most we want to spend on a book is $2.00. We want that book on. We want that book, at minimum, to be able to sell for ten dollars and ninety-five cents, and we want that book to have a sales rank of five million or better. So anywhere from one to five million. If the book that our book sources are looking at meet those three criteria points, then we give them the authorization to buy, and then we'll compensate them for that. So think about that criteria and come up with your own criteria. Again, I'm not going to beat a dead horse here. I know I talked about it a lot in the book, and I've talked about it in other videos in this in in this course. Um, some new sellers who are just starting out who don't have a lot of working capital want to invest less in books. So maybe you can raise that or you can lower that buy cost down to a dollar or a dollar fifty. Also, if, if you're struggling with, uh, if you're brand new to Amazon FBA and you notice that you only have a 5,000 item limit, you may want to lower your or you may want to tighten up your sales rank criteria a bit. Some people would recommend you go down to one million or two million in sales rank. 
and that way you're only buying books from one to two million, they're going to have a higher likelihood to sell than books that have a rank of three, four, five million. So just something to think about. And again, it's going to your buying criteria is going to evolve as your business grows. You're going to find books that you really like, and you're going to find books that you don't like, and you're going to be able to craft your own custom criteria to fit what you like and what you don't like about sourcing books. So uh, just keep that in mind. It can be fluid. It's, there's flexibility here. You really got to find a criteria that you like that works well for your business. The next you want to come up with a compensation plan. So how are you going to pay the people that are working for you? Now, you want to put together a, a compensation plan that encourages success. You want to put together a structured paying plan that is directly in line with the goals of your organization. Now, there's more to compensation than just hourly pay or base pay finder's fee. We're going to get into the different ways you can pay people here in a minute. There's also some non-monetary components as well. When you think about running an organization, which is what you're going to do, you're going to want to encourage and support and inspire all the people that work with your organization to find good books. And there's, there's ways to do that without having to pay them more money. In fact, I think one of the main reasons why people quit jobs, I can't remember where I read this, this is that it was like 70% of people quit their jobs. The, the number one reason they give is not money, is not advancement opportunities, is not uh, benefit packages, but it's a lack of recognition. You know, people just want to be recognized. They want to feel valued. And so if you can pay somebody well and give them the recognition and the encouragement and the support that they really desire, then you'll have a happy employee. And so think about compensation, think about that type of incentivization in a, a variety of different perspectives. Now there's three things to consider. Proper compensation plan structure will, number one, impact worker motivation. So the better you, the better you structure your compensation plan, the, the more likely your workers will be motivated to work harder. Now you, you have a poor compensation structure, either you're just paying, you're not paying them enough, or the way things are structured aren't pushing people in the direction that you want them to go, then you can't expect positive results. Number two, your compensation plan will have a direct effect on retention rates. So you want, you, you, you're training in new people, you put a lot of time and energy and effort and money into bringing new people on board. And once they're with your organization, you want to keep them. Having a good compensation plan will help your, your retention rate. And finally, number three, you want to make sure that your compensation package is in compliance with the law. There's lots, lots of different regulations and, and things you'll need to consider when putting your compensation plan together. So your compensation plan should motivate. Now it says, uh, smallbusiness.com has this quote here, the greatest impact of money on productivity and performance is in jobs where performance is directly related to compensation. So that's interesting. And we'll talk about the different ways you can pay people, but I'm of the mindset that you should pay people in a way that motivates them to do what you want them to do. Now you can do that, you can pay it a bunch of different ways, we're talking about four different ways you can pay your people, but uh, regardless of that, you can put things on top, you can add benefits, you can, you can do like a profits, profit sharing plan with your employees. Like if they exceed certain goals, you can give them a portion of the profits. Um, there can be some commission-based salaries added on top of what they're already making. Or, or bonuses, again, it's just extra incentives, monetary incentives that are going to really encourage them to work harder for your business. Also, a good compensation plan will help with retention. So, so smallbusiness.com also says retaining productive employees is critical to running a successful business. Now, if you, if you compensate people well, they feel like they're being treated fairly, they're going to have more loyalty to you, and they're going to stick around with your business. They're going to stand up for it, and, and, and even through the thick and thin. Also, sec also consider secondary benefits, as we talked about in the first slide, like bonuses or even just non-monetary motivation. You know, appreciation and recognition are super important. Promotions, depending on how you structure your business, maybe there's room for advancement. That does help with retention. If people feel like they can work out, uh, work their way up a ladder, or work their way to a better position, sometimes they'll work harder in the here and now. And finally, expanded responsibilities. I don't know about you, I know I'm an entrepreneur at heart, but when I used to work corporate America, I kind of would get sick of a job after like eight months. I just would want to kind of do something else. And so having some flexibility in your organization so people can move around and experience new things and try different things out, if that's possible, 
could help with employee intent retention. And finally, you want to make sure your, comp your compensation plan is in compliance with the law. What you can do is you can Google these two at, and definitely you should, when, you're, when you're structuring your compensation plan, you should be referring to them. The Fair Labor Act, uh, Fair Labor, sorry, Fair Labor Standards Act regulates the federal minimum wage, child labor, overtime wages, and equal pay. So if you're planning on paying, um, you know, having employees to work for you, you need to know what these laws say so you're not in violation of them. Now the other one is the Equal Pay Act, which prohibits employees from basing compensation on an employee's gender. Again, you want to be an equal opportunity employer, and you don't want to favor people based on their age or their race or their sexual orientation. I mean, obviously all this seems like common sense, but unknowingly sometimes people have these biases and they build a business with all these biases intact and then you can get in big trouble if the, if the government can prove that you are, in fact, discriminating against some of your employees.